Hello and welcome to Quality Policing. I am Peter Moskos, and I always say, say I'm thrilled to be here, but this time I really am um, because um, I feel like I'm in the Blues Brothers and we're getting the band back together. I'm here with uh, Billy Gorta and John Yo, who are um, both uh, retired NYPD and particularly of interest to me because these two guys were either the the geniuses or the flunkies or both uh, behind the origination of NYPD's famous Comstat, something a lot of people talk about and not many people understand. And maybe this is the first time I can put in a plug for my book, which isn't out yet, but will be out in early 2023, um, uh, which is on the crime drop. And that's how I met these guys. I actually met Billy at a bar in Queens after a Mets game through a mutual friend. And um, he set me up with with half the people I interview in my book, quite frankly. Um, so welcome, guys, and uh, it's, it's good to see you. I, I've met Billy in person. I've never even seen John in a picture. Um, but um, I don't know where you want to start, uh, how you became cops, or, 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 or you want to jump right to, uh, to, 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 to Comstat. I was born when I was very young, and then, then I got old. <laughs> yeah, I'm done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and me, I, I, I was actually, uh, I was in Georgetown Foreign Service. I felt the calling. I was a monk at Villanova for a few years. And then uh, when I had left the order and came home, I'm laying in bed. My brother and I were still, you know, I moved back home and my brother hadn't gotten married yet. And we were, two of us were up in a room together. But he was on a job for maybe a year. And uh, I said, hey, Nick, don't you got to go to work today? And he says, yeah. He picks up the phone. He goes, this is yo. I need an e-day. Okay. He puts the phone down. He says, okay, I went to work. This is a job for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I put in for it. I was uh, too old to get Nassau by a couple of weeks. And uh, they ended up calling me for the city. And, uh, I took the job. And, and what year was that? Uh, 1985. 1985. So you go to Brooklyn, yeah. right? If I remember correctly. I was um, went to what they called NSU 13. That was the 7-3 and the 7-5 Browns release, New York, uh, bed -Stuy. And then from there, I went, I stayed in the, either, the, uh, that was assigned to the 7-5, then to this thing called Toe Pack, which did the three, those three Brooklyn North precincts again. And then when that ended, I went back to the 7-3. And when I got promoted sergeant, they moved me across the street to Bushwick to the 8-3 precinct. Because once you were in Brooklyn North long enough, you were considered incorrigible and you couldn't deal with normal people any longer. So, you were kind of right. Yeah, there, there was a car crash somewhere along here. I want to mention that because I think it, it becomes relevant later. It becomes relevant every month when I pay my mortgage. I tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, I don't know, it was probably, let's see, I got, I had made sergeant in like 90, 91. So um, I don't know, maybe 88, 89, whatever. I, I, whatever it was, we responded to a gun run on the border to 7-3 and a 7-5. And we, everybody's going lights and sirens. And it wasn't just a gun run. Housing was in pursuit of a man with a gun. So we're on New Lots Avenue. We passed a line of standing cars heading towards a red light. And as we got to the red light, the light turned green. I can remember this. Anyhow, we're going in. Next thing you know, a Brooklyn North Task Force van comes the opposite way. Come And wet. we collide. They T-bone us. We do 180 and go up into a brick wall. So they towed us away. Um, and nobody's wearing seatbelts back then, right? What were seatbelts? Yeah. First time I put a seatbelt on was the day I left the pension board and I said, they will give me a ticket. <laughs> so they, they towed us away. Make a long story short, I was on a sergeant's list. So uh, they eventually stuck me inside in the 7-3 uh, to be what's called a station house manager. My back was messed up anyhow. And you don't want to do it. You don't want to be out sick if come promotion time or else you're going to get skipped. So I would do the station house manager and that's how I got my basic comp stat start. All right. Um, because as house manager, you're playing with computers. That's that's. Well, we did the robbery stats basically uh, every month or you had to send the numbers up to headquarters to the chief of patrols office. So Say for argument's sake, the 73 precinct did 285 robberies a month. We would put it on a little disc in a program called SMART, uh, which was a, probably the 
simplest precursor ever to Microsoft Office, but it had four integrated modules. And we put the 285 in there and we'd send the five and a quarter inch floppy disk up to headquarters to the chief of patrol and they'd read it in to a master database. And as long as you stayed within your numbers, if you, your average was 285 and you stayed between say 270 and 290, you didn't hear anything. If, you, if, 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 if it went off the charts all of a sudden, you might get a phone call. And if it fell real low, you might get a phone call, but otherwise don't rock the boat, keep everything steady. And that's how we, how they did business. It wasn't that G 285 people got robbed this month. We should do something about that. It was, well, just don't let it be three and a quarter. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I should point out, uh, I don't need you to repeat stuff you said here before, Billy. You've been on this podcast before in a thrilling two-part episode that got literally dozens of views. Uh, actually, maybe hundreds even. But um, uh, so you know, I don't need you to, to repeat yourself. Um, but but what's what's the brief story? How do, you know of your early days in the NYPD, and how did you two meet? Well, we met. We met in the chief of patrol's office. You know, was, um, Mario, was that Salvaggi at the time? Salvaggi, yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, I had been, I had been in the uh, Manhattan South, the uh, patrol borough of Manhattan South. I was the special projects. I was the uh, the borough administrator. The uh, the chief there, he was a piece of work, and we used to call the hallway down to his office. That was Torpedo Alley, and he comes out of the office staring at you, walking the forty feet to you. It's like okay. He hates me. I hate him. I was like, I, I got to do something here. <laughs> so I wound up, you know, as I had some talent, a recognizable talent. That's how I wound up in chief of patrol. You could type, you know, and what I can, I well, the typing is the less good part of it, you know. But I can, I can bang it out if you need it, and I could. Well, the typing's bad, but it's probably better than most people, most of the cops, but because they don't recognize what those things are written on the uh, the keys. That said. <laughs> You know, need somebody make a report, compile a report, type something out, do this. I'm your guy. You know, my I, you know, uh, but I got into the PD because basically, you know, it was an early admission to college, and then with with all the freedom that entails, basically drank my way into the police department, and then, you know, was a cop of Queens. You know, made sergeant, went to the, we moved upstate for a couple of years, so I, uh, I worked in the Bronx for a bit, came back to Manhattan, here we are, and then. To the borough and onward, to the chief of patrol and glory. Yeah, glory, like glory. I said. <laughs> so, so when I got up there, yeah. I answered an ad. They had an ad for, uh, which was the equivalent, I guess, of the station house manager for the chief of patrol. He was the person that compiled all those discs. <laughs> and, On the uh, other end of it. Yeah. So I answered the ad. Little did I know that, uh, you know, Salvaggi was a chief. He was pleasant enough. He didn't. You know, but my immediate supervisor who hired me, the man probably has a huge voodoo doll with, you know, you, and sticks it all the time. So bygones be bygones. Uh, we'll just leave it at Jay. <laughs> I was his I was say, you beat me to that, John. <laughs> yeah, I, I was his personal punch and big. So <laughs> I don't know why. Every week I come in and get another beating. Okay, whatever. So I was actually looking to get out. So at any rate, I, I said, I got to get out of here. I'll go back to the 7-3. I don't care. And uh, that's happened to be the time when Giuliani got elected and the changeover started. Now they were all running around like crazy people because Salvaggi wanted to keep his job. And they're going through place by place assessing what they want to do. And uh, uh, I so there, there's a So yeah, there's, there's a change in administration. So um. Giuliani's elected uh, uh, late 93, takes over 94. Yeah. Um, so David Dinkins is voted out of office. Ray Kelly um, gets the boot. Um, and uh, in comes Bratton. And he brings over his buddy from transit, Maple. Um, so they were both transit cops. This is before the merge of transit housing and city police in New York City, which happened in, I think, in April 95, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, or maybe 96. It was April Fool's Day. Um, and Bratton gets his team in there, uh, which is... Uh, and did you know these people yet? I'm talking about Maple, Lanham, and Julian, and probably a few people I'm not thinking of. Me? Yeah, I know them all. 
he missed the president. Yeah, well, the, the same, Billy that was, was your special soul. skill. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's I, that, I know you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, well, because I knew Animal when I was in Chief Patrol, he he became the disorder control guy. And I was in what they his core program liaison. So he was a program and I was liaising. So I would go out and do his thing and you know, so uh, you know, uh so part of the whole uh, uh tactical response to uh, disorder, that was Louie and I was there liaising, you know, I was on both sides the chief wants this, chief likes that, chief hates this, you know. And, uh, you know, Timothy, you know, I knew from around and Julian, I'd run into in Manhattan South. Hmm. So, uh, you know, when I was at the borough and, and before, you know, he was a prison commander there. And when did you feel that things are going to be different? Because I'm going to, to make a long story short, I'm going to say things were kind of the same for 25 years before this in some way. Well, when Animal walked in there, that was right off the bat. You could tell there was a change. And I'm just going to jump out of order a little bit, but he would present himself as an almost an ogre. People would tremble when Chief Animal would come in and get on. And, you know, as we had this thing going, he used to take great pleasure in screaming from his office, in the, the one side of the chief of patrol and later chief of department's office, out to the other, yo, get it here, yo. Oh, and they'd all be sitting there watching me like a man walk, dead man walking, you know? <laughs> then you'd walk in, he closed the door, have a cigar, but yeah, he's like everything going today. <laughs> but it, 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 he he was a, he was certainly a character in Maple. Maple, I wouldn't have known from a hole in the wall. All I knew was one day he shows up next to my desk, and I'm like, I don't know who this man is, but people seem to be all jumping up and doing this, that, and the other thing, and not knowing which way to go. Uh, and I was sitting there just like this in front of a computer, and I, said, yes, sir, can I help you? Yeah, well, Louis, Louis came in with a bit of a chip on his shoulder, you know, I mean, he was a street guy, and from what I hear, from what I understand, street guy extraordinaire, so we were all, you know, house mouse little pussies, and, you know, we were we were afraid to go out in the street and face bad guys, so, I mean, over time, you know, and I, I imagine for some people that might actually have been the case, but, you know, you know, we had, we had been places and seen things that, you know, uh, uh, that perhaps adults shouldn't see, so at any rate, uh, you know, uh, at any rate, uh, you know, so he came in, but then he calmed down. He saw how the thing functions. You know, it's like, you know, you want, you know, you want to do all these things, and, and it's always the same in the police department. And they're doing it now again. Get rid of all the cops. Get all these assholes out of here. Civilianize this, that, and the other. They put them on the street until the police commissioner needs a report or the mayor needs a report. Then it's get those fucks back. So we had to go through that process. You know. And how how did um. This idea of compile of getting timely, accurate information happened. When did when did anybody well, like care? Said, this right. funny looking character shows up in front of my desk, you know, with his bowler and two tone shoes and his bow tie, and says uh, he basically says, you know, look, I've been all over the police department. I'm trying to get up to date statistics. What can you do for me? I said, well, I, we get these numbers every, you know a month or whatever it is from the chief of uh, from the precincts and i ate him up i said let me take a look at this thing and see what i can do but i'm pretty sure that i can manipulate the program that they sent me to this i can give you these seven majors that we call them the murder, murder rape robbery so the part one crimes minus arson one crimes. Yeah. uh on a weekly basis you know just the crimes themselves we started with and, and you can have a report every week the same way I do it. He says, well, how long is this going to take me? Six months, seven months? I said, no, I think I can do it in a couple of days or a week, maybe. Let me see. He's like, you're serious, right? Said, yeah. So that was when the big snowstorm came to New York. And I scrunched up, uh, scrounged up a laptop from uh, the office. And I couldn't get home on Long Island Railroad anyhow. This so is February '94. Yeah, I trudged to my grandmother's house down on Baltic Street in Brooklyn, from the Atlantic Avenue train station through the snow, and I sat there and basically just modified Rita. what we had into the initial version of what came to be known as Comstat, and then. Well, uh, that, but that, before before Mabel turned up at John's desk, my understanding was is that. Brian was going to have a weekly meeting with somebody from each of the 
uh, bureau chief's offices, not necessarily the bureau chief. Now they, they meet all the time in executive staff. But so he's going to have somebody from each of the chief's offices come and basically give the state a play, have a, you know. And so Maple was like, you know, can you get weekly crime stats? And, and asking the chiefs. And they were like, no, you know, because what happens, they're only preliminary, you know, you know the guys get in trouble because they, they, they're they not quite right yet and until they go to arrest and crime coding and the FBI and, you know, so we can't, we can't do that. It's not, it's not impossible. So that's how that came. It's like, it was like, it was, it was impossible witchcraft it's, and, and probably illegal to consider Jews in our stats. So to up to date stats. And then so Maple says, okay, let's how do we do this? You know? And here we are. But the precursor was he wanted, yeah, just like it was, tell me what the state of play is. Yeah. So when I got this thing actually started, uh we 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 sent out that you know, I sent out a modified version of the program to all the commands, and they were in to fill this out every week and send the their disc to the borough, and then the boroughs in turn would drive the disc, the master disc up to headquarters or the individual disc. So I even forget if we began with a borough disc or not. But either way, they were supposed to bring them up. And we gave them a start date. It was somewhere around Valentine's It was Valentine's Day, right? Yeah. We, we, we sat there on Valentine's Day with no <laughs> Oh that's right. Yeah. My yeah. wife got five and twelve she got twelve um, um pork buns from uh, from uh, uh, from Chinatown as yeah. a Valentine. That's Valentine. a good Valentine present. Well, yeah well for some it was for some it wasn't right. Because then these things didn't show show up. So, you know, I'm piddly sergeant. Yo, what do I know? But the mean, brutal Lieutenant Gorder at the time, you know, subsequently captain, but he picked up that phone. He beat these people like mashed potatoes. He can tell it better. But then we were going to have that disc, and we were going to have that disc tonight. Well, then the sound is, the, the, my line was always, the next sound you'll hear will be the chief patrol picking up the line. Yeah. I and mean, he wasn't even in the building, but you have to say it. It's like, you know, o'clock in the morning, we right. <laughs> tell I was full of cheap and home, you know, because so we got right. him. We read him yeah. into the machine, and for the first few weeks, it was bizarro. Like Billy said, they, 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 they might as well have been those hieroglyphic characters on the keyboards from all they were typing in. You'd have a precinct that would put down that they had like 2,600 rapes this week. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's going on over there? Oh. It was an error. I let me uh, let me just mention here because um, I don't want to take away from your genius, because at the time it was. But I want to mention how when we talk about this computer program, how simple it seems in hindsight, yes. which is all this is is a compiling spreadsheet, right? That's all. Basically, I mean, we turned it did into a database, but yes, it was initially. But with all and with with all due respect to my uh, to my partner John. You know, it was more a matter of will than skill. You know, it's like we're going to bowl this through and get this and then teach the precincts. And we had to go out to the precincts to spread the word. And it was like, you know, the, the, not, this is not to denigrate what John did because it was for its time, pretty, pretty bang up job. But that nope. was only part of it. I mean, Nobody you were also constrained by um, how big, how big were the floppy disks back, back, back then? Five and a quarter. And how much memory, I mean? What they hold? What three sixty k? That's not M K. That's, that's no. not M B. That's K. yeah. <laughs> then we went to we graduated, we graduated to the smaller ones, to the yeah, three and a half. half. And then uh, you know, I mean, yeah. as this thing grew over the first few years, I mean, we were able to basically squeeze out a lot of technological changes from uh, within the department. We wanted to add arrests to the report to correlate with the crimes. Well, that, we used to have to go down to MISD, the uh, computer, oh, yeah. and, and on a regular basis and threaten them with all sorts of bodily pain to, to give us anything. Um, we had well, one- when they give it to you, they give it to you on the green and white paper. Yeah. The green and white straight no, paper. No, 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 man. It's a pile of paper. Like, you they came a out a little printer printing. with the chits on the side, that kind of yeah. thing? Yeah. Oh, that yeah. One. Yeah, and he's like, dude, you have a mainframe. You understand? You can write a query to the mainframe with these parameters and give that to me. That's all I want. I mean, one incident that would perfectly, I guess, illustrate this was when we had the meetings, we used to have to pack up everything we had on the 13th floor, put it on chairs, and... (laughs) 
<laughs> you about that? Yeah, put it on those desk on chairs. The and rolling chairs down to the second floor, first the second floor press room, and eventually the second eighth, floor. The, the eighth floor. Okay, uh, where we had the meetings. So one day we go in there and we said, "Look, this is ridiculous. You have a network in here. There's a land. Can't we just instead of pushing these machines down here every day, every week, but twice a week at the time we're having meetings? Can't we just access the the, the data that's on there through the land?" Oh, no, we're going to have to do a study. There's too many wires in the ceiling. This could take months. Bada, bada, bada. Okay. So Billy and I go over to uh, J&R, right? Right. Yeah. We go to J&R. We buy a 100-foot bolt of land cable. <laughs> Can you at least charge this to the department? That's one thing I don't have in my book. Did you have to pay oh, this out of your did. pocket? We bought pins at the World Trade Center to yeah. stick the little maps. And... Yeah, no, we, we, you, know, you always put your hand in your pocket. You know? Hey, what the hell? So we opened the window up on 13 and chucked the cable out. <laughs> and we pull it back in the window down on eight. <laughs> oh, boss, we tell him, oh, where is everything's hooked up? We're not going to push the chairs. <laughs> oh, this is great. The next thing you know, the commanding officer from MISD, he's, he's having an embolism. You can't have a wire out the window <laughs> of the building. <laughs> so I'll tell you, we tell you what, you go up there, you see Chief Anamon. You tell him you're going to pull his wire out. <laughs> that week, they're up in the ceiling. We were wired. <laughs> what, what is MIST? Management MIST. Information Systems Division. Yes. Whatever that means. <laughs> it doesn't so mean you, much. You knew you had the complete backing of, of Animon, I, it sounds oh, like. Oh, Animon yeah. and Maple. Let me tell yeah. you. Give you an example of how much these guys stood behind you. When the Three four precincts split, okay, and they, they they created the new the three three. We had a, and he's a nice, beautiful man, Joe Esposito, but lovely guy. Yeah, what happened was we had no way to really do these statistics when you had a three three that just popped up out of nowhere. What do we can compare it to? So what we did was for comparative sake and to allow some sort of rational discussion, we created a fictitious. Uh, don't worry about that when I'm in the middle of a tornado watch. So if I disappear, I'm probably been electrocuted or blown off. I'll pick up the slack, John. Yeah. So, uh, 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 where the hell was I? A fictitious, uh, fictitious uh, comparison three, statistical. Three. Oh, yeah. So we like, we made this fictitious 3-5 precinct where we combined the two numbers. No, oh, the next day I know the phone's ringing on my desk. Yeah, Sergeant Young. Yeah, says Bo. Oh, hey, how you doing, boss? He goes, uh, so it started off as how you doing, yo? And he asked about it. I said, look, we got to make this three five just for comparative stakes. So the conversation eventually devolved, <laughs> like devolved. To listen to me, yo, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Hold on, Inspector. I'll, I'll be with you in a minute, please. I went back in. I got the Anamon. Anamon picks up the phone. I'm standing in his office. He says, yeah, hey, Joe, how you doing? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, so what did he tell you? Goddamn do it. Boom! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a similar one with Maple when we merged um, um, housing in. So we had no ha separate housing stats. So my get this bright idea. He says, why don't we get someone from each of the, the PSAs, the housing precincts, and we get the last year's stats, because we only need the last year, and we'll go through the seven to get the, 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 for, the for their areas, and we'll just Count them out. Do them by hand. Set the table and, and, and that's, oh, that's housing. That's not housing. This is housing. That's not housing. And then, and then just make the stats for last year for housing. So I got them there. And it's, of course, they're on vacation. So they're, you know, they're taking their time. And the chief from housing goes, no, these people got to go back. This is no good. You know, they, they, this is taking too long. This guy, they have to go back. So I got a mate, I says, you know, he's breaking my balls. He wants them to go back. You know, he says, Billy, and I, again, I was a lieutenant at the time, and this guy's a chief. He says, Billy, you just tell him you're in charge. Doesn't he understand? Or don't you understand? You're in charge. That's the end of it. So, okay. <laughs> they held back with everything. I was like, a, instead of three stripes, I had three stars, it felt like. Oh, yeah. And, and when we two, walked and the two of us walked oh. into an office in the building together. Oh, yeah. Pampers yeah. all around. Hide, hide your babies. Oh, no, it was... Yeah. <laughs> And I thought we were pretty nice guys. I yeah. thought we were like, you know, we were a fun bunch, you know? One, one or the other, maybe. But if the two of us walked <laughs> in that office, they would yeah. be, 
Oh, right on my ass. <laughs> they, my this brother, is, my um, brother fact, told me they used to hang my picture up in the precincts. He, he was working at 7-5. They had my picture hanging up in a lounge, and the cops would sit there, and they'd throw darts at me with a bullseye. <laughs> right. And the 7-5 did well. The 7-5, yeah. you know, they, they were having a good time. Some of the other places, you know, I could see, I could see with the, the CO's grasp when it destroys, I could see the cops hating us. But the seven five, they were making fat. Yeah. Um, if I can quote Jack Maple here, because um, you know, he passed away in two thousand and one, at a young Lord age. Marciano. And um, I um accessed, I was uh, given copies of uh, interviews that Chris Mitchell did with him in nineteen ninety seven and ninety eight, which feature heavily in my book. And this Jack Maple says, "I said I got to get this crime weekly." And of course, they said it couldn't be done. They could collect the data, but they weren't required to. Nothing on a weekly thing at all. Never would they have to do that. And he goes on and he says, the chief's for feeling me out a little. I remember the chief of detective guy saying, the chief says you can't get this information weekly. You can have it monthly. So I go to the chief of detectives and I say, listen, I need to get information from your detectives weekly. We go back and forth and he says, you know, you're lucky I like you. I said, you got it wrong. You're lucky I like you. <laughs> they That's Jack. They didn't take him <laughs> serious at first. They thought because he dressed uniquely, and he came out of it, and, and he was a. Total he was just rat. a lieutenant in transit, you know. He was just yeah. some that punk, you know. Yeah, but they, they, and the man was a genius. He was a genius, yeah. but he was such a. He was a great guy too. I slept there. I, I literally, I slept there on a cop, and for a while, I slept in his office until I eventually got right. uh, my own office out of stairs. Yes, which happened to be the office of the my initial main tormentor mentioned previously. <laughs> uh, but he used to come in and sneak in at 536 in the morning, put it and the, the band was a hair bag, you know, and he'd get right up into your right next to your head while you're sleeping. And scream out, Good morning, Johnny. <laughs> ah! <laughs> yeah. Now, so you're you guys are look, it's a civil service job. You're paid, you know, a living wage, I think is what it would be called today. Um, but you're literally yeah. sleeping there. What is what's driving you? Why? I mean, you don't have to be doing this. Uh, I'll answer quickly and then let Billy I'll probably be more relevant. Okay. But when I got on the job and the whole time I was there, we always said the job ain't on a level. OK, it's all BS. We go about our thing, but it ain't on a level, you know, uh, and it was frustrating to us at that time. We weren't even allowed to approach like known bookies and and and, and dr drug dealers and stuff. They would have the machines going into place, and it, it was a joke. Now we were finally in a position where the job could be on a level, where people we really felt this sense of of, of pride, not in ourselves, but in what we were doing. That the kids. They didn't have to sleep in the bathtubs at night so they wouldn't get hit with stray rounds. People were starting to use the playgrounds again because you couldn't go out in the playground. You get hit with a stray on, on, on a seesaw. Mama would go to work and she'd never come home. And all of a sudden, we started to see these numbers falling and people, you know, actually coming out of their holes like after a war. And given that opportunity to do that was it was a moral obligation and it, it caught it felt like no pain whatsoever my kid thought my child my young my eldest he thought the phone was was called dad dad but it, it, it yeah what we were doing was bigger than ourselves and it was the right thing to do yep. well john first when we go offline we're gonna have a long talk about the word briefly but, <laughs> but <laughs> But in the meantime, it's, you know, it was important work. All of a sudden, you know, most days are just shoveling shit. Their people are abusing you, you know, or whatever. You know, you're writing your summonses. You're there, you know, it's like you're making no progress in the world. And all of a sudden, you know, this thing is building and you know it's important for all the reasons John said. It's, it was important work. And, you know, I was had, so now 94. See, uh, I had my third child. I was working on my degree at Columbia. And I was working every hour God gave to um, at Comstat. And it's just, this is what we do because it's important work. And you don't have to get that feeling in any job, by the way, you know. And we go off not, on, I'll have a word about eloquent. Um, we're not unique either. I mean, you know, we did our thing 
on the computers and on desks, but there are guys out there grinding that grind every day with that same sense of dedication and commitment r- right now. Uh, and, you know, their lives are on the line every minute. They go there. They go there with no concern for themselves, for their families, because they know they're doing the right thing. That, and that's the whole point of being a police officer. This way it is. I mean, if yeah, I'm happy for uh, if my book ends up being somewhat of an ode to civil service, I'm happy to have that be the case because it's an, there's an underrated nobility in that that I think a lot of people um, not just don't understand, but even can disparage at times that people care. They want to make the city a better place. They're from here. They live here. Um, it's, a, it's a message that the NYPD, well, police in general, don't do a very good job of um, putting out. Well, I didn't, don't think they helped themselves after we left. Because, you know, yeah. you, go, you can have too much of a good thing, you know? And uh, we always went with Bratton's philosophy and no sharp pencils. And Explain uh, what that means. It's not a, it's wanted, not a common phrase, let me just say. Okay, we, we wanted accurate reporting. Don't fudge the numbers. Don't massage the numbers. Don't tell me because this poor woman was sodomized and raped that you're going to put it down on the report as a sodomy which isn't one of the seven uh, of harassment, right? Or, 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 or plead down a, an assault on a police officer and put it down as a misdemeanor assault because it's automatically a felony. assault. we don't want any, we want an accurate portrayal. It's not helping anybody to give us some fudgy numbers. Uh, so we, that, that's what we- That was the truth and we'll work on it. That was the point of it. I mean, there was a time there was uh, a CEO in the ninth precinct and they were, and and we were still on the second floor, but Louie and Jack were sharpening the knives for him. They were just, they were honing the edge and they were going to slice this guy to ribbons. And because it was a big jump. And all of a sudden the guy gets up and he says, okay, I had X number of robberies. Y with this, Z was that, A was this, B was this, C was this. We did this, we did that, we did the other thing. We made, we made an arrest here, we did two arrests there. We interviewed these guys, we did this, we did that. I put more cops here, we did more cops there. And Louie and Jack were like breathless when it was over. They couldn't catch, they couldn't catch their breath. This guy just bowled them over. It's like, I'm working, dudes. And they were like, okay, you know, we were gonna give you a kick up the ass, but we can't. You didn't right? get in trouble I, because your numbers went up. If you were working, you know, you're not responsible for human nature and your command. But as long as you were trying and you were honest and, and working hard on it. But uh, I think other you. ones, I used to get, I used to have them print me out like hundreds of reports, all the burglaries in the command. And I'd sit there all and read every single one and then make make the crib notes and then hand them. And then you'd see the guy, the commander get up there and start talking all sorts of nonsense. And Anamon, when you knew him, he would sit in his chair and he'd start to rock like okay. this. And then he'd push his glasses back and he'd be rocking and push the glasses. And Billy and I'd be sitting back there behind the screen. Here it comes. We're like holding hands onto the table. Oh my God! Here it comes! Here it God. comes! <laughs> but you know, it's like yeah, I, you know, I've always been surprised that there, there has been never been a gun player at a constat meeting because guys, <laughs> you just see them, their career died. Their all their life plans just ended. You know, now I got to get out and do something else. It's like, holy shit! I mean, that was some, that was a high wire. Yeah, and there was no you know, didn't want to be mean, you know, necessarily, but it is New York where people go wave good morning with one finger to their neighbors, you know. So it, it, it was the way it is. But you had COs getting sick into the little fire extinguisher box in the post. We had a lieutenant crawling on her hands and knees behind us on the floor so they wouldn't see her trying to get out. And he's like yelling, at, Lieutenant, get off the floor, get off the floor. Uh, we, uh, we, I forgot all this shit. Yes, <laughs> it was it was crazy. Some of them, but again, what I was started to allude to initially was after we left, they kept pushing it and pushing, it, trying to squeeze that last drop of blood out of there, that last drop of juice out of the grape, and you can't do that. Not and the other, the, the other, the other thing. Oh, sorry, John. No, I'm done. The other thing they did was. We had meetings scheduled. So, like, there were eight boroughs, you know, and you came in, you came in in a rotation. Every four weeks, you were going to be there. And 
So you knew you were coming and you had to be prepared. But because of that, we were also able to pull inspections. So the chief of patrol had an investigative unit. I forget what the hell they were called. But they would go out like the day before a meeting and they would go pull some 61s at the precinct, you know, to make sure it was all on the level. So that way, and then one of the guys said, when they start bullshit and the chief would go, hey, look, this is this is a robbery you have as a grand loss. And they, this, you know, is an, a felony that you have as a misdemeanor. What's with these? And hand them the 61s. So they knew they had a, you know, we, there was a, some checks on it that we couldn't just get up there and do the old soft shoe. You know, we, we would check on all that. So then they got rid of the scheduled meetings. So it's like, oh, if you have a problem, we're going to call you in or whatever, or if we haven't seen you in a long time. And let's face it, you know, uh, it, that that doesn't count. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, whenever. And I'll just make up that bullshit when the time comes. Yeah. But really, they, they I mean, at least in my opinion, they just took some of these things beyond the pale, the stop and frisk, right. stuff like that. You just, you, you, there comes a point. What, what year not, did that start to happen? That would that was after we were out of there. I think Kelly was in there at point or whatever. I'm John, not sure. There was always a problem with stop and frisk. And if you remember one of the early yeah. concept meetings, we were down on two. Some chief said, you know, why the street crime make uh, collars and the borough anti-crime doesn't. And that chief said it's because the borough anti-crime obeys the Constitution of the United States yeah. of America. Yeah. And I, yeah. I had to go upstairs and get Louie out of a meeting. Well, so, but there was always a problem with it. It's when they started counting it like it was something important as opposed to, you know, the idea of like, what do you do all day? You right. know? You see a kid walking down the street. And he's leaning over to one side and he keeps grabbing his crotch every 22 seconds. And he's wearing a parker in the middle of July and, you know, all this sort of stuff. Mm-hmm, yeah, an experienced officer would say, but just because there's two guys on the corner doesn't mean you say, okay, your buddy, I'm fucking so You know? Yeah. As I said last time, uh, Peter, you know, every cop should read Terry and have to write something about it. You know? Just, just to show that you've read it and you understand some of it. You know, to me, the, the truth yeah. is, yeah, and when course, stops weren't counted accurately back then. And when once they started being counted is when it started going really haywire because then it became that productivity stat you're talking about. It right. became good for its own sake rather than a what are you actually doing about the problem? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, Animone said, uh, and he's also been on this podcast, you know, he said he was tough. Um, he said the problem with Comstead, he said it's in a room with 100 people or more, and there was a downside to that. But I don't think you could turn an organization like the NYPD around as quickly and as dramatically if you're not willing to break a couple legs along the way and bruise a couple of egos. It's not going to happen. This was my chance, my opportunity, and it became clear to me that you had to be a tough guy to do it. No regrets. No, 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 no. But one of you, I think I'm quoting one of you now, just said is, is when Bratton left, it's when the ideas ran out. Or um, that might have been. Yeah, that, 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 that was me. But, you know, like, <laughs> or, because there was one idea. Bratton, and I've heard this from other chiefs as well, Bratton would have changed, would have mutated six or eight times. If he was still a, he, or if he was still a commissioner, it would be 30 times. The guy sees what's going on or what has to be done, and let's do that. Not let's stick with the same thing. As I say, he was the kind, he was the guy. The first guy in, in who wasn't just a regular, uh, um, uh, you know, regular uh, white shield cop to say, hey, why do we do this? I mean, the cops say that all the time because they could see gen- the general stupidity of the, the uh, of the hierarchy. But it was like the first time a guy with authority goes, why do we do this? And it's like, uh, it's like well, let's not do that. You know, so, you know, he was he would have. He would have adapted and adapted and adapted. And Comstock may not even be what it is. May, it may be gone. We may have, you know, uh, solved solve nuclear it. fusion. Yeah, because he would, like Billy said, as certain situations got down to, you know, near zero or, I mean, you know, you got millions of people in the city. You're doing 300 homicides a year. You're not going to erase original sin. I'm so sorry. So, you know, uh, you, you Homicide number change, one outside the gates of Garden of Eden. Yeah, yeah, you, you got to change change tactics a little bit or a lot of bit, depending on the circumstance, and not just keep beating the same drum. Now they went the total opposite. I I, I feel sorry for him because from what I read, you know, the current mayor he wants to try to revive some of these 
parts of broken windows and uh, minor crimes, but they're up against a whole different situation than we were back then. Back then we had a effect change in our own culture. Uh, and then we were able to draw in after a while, the DA's offices and stuff and, 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 and parole and things like that, because they saw how they, and they participate in the meetings. And we got, now you have it where you can go out and lock up 200 people. If every judge, if they, if they let them, it's like, let them lose Bruce times a hundred. And if, if the courts aren't going to back you, if the uh, district attorneys are going rogue, you got bail reform. What are you going to do? You can't, if you can't keep these predators away, how are you going to do this? And the nightmare of change, um, you know, not all of which is bad, but some of it is. Um, there's also a uh, witness contact info turned over to the defense team, which is, um, I hear, I've not, you know, I don't know this firsthand, but is having a chilling effect on people talking. Um, Nine millimeter to the skull will do that. You, um, well, especially then if you're, you know, you're not detained after arrest after you yep. snitch on somebody and they're right back there and you as your downstairs neighbors um things you know people are complaining about like you know the city council stripped vending enforcement from the nypd well that's their right but but then you can't expect police to enforce vending that's right exactly. and, and half the vendors are selling the stuff they just ripped out of the, <laughs> out of the right. Versace store down the block right. and the cops have to call 311 to report it yeah. So, I mean, that's, it's just that, you know, all right, I'm going to go into the vernacular. That's just fucking stupid. Um, so, so is that Latin? Um, yeah. So, but so, yeah, they're not, just, things have, the laws have changed. It makes it harder. Um, cops need legal authority to do whatever they do. Um, there is one thing that mere, you know, so they say it can't be done, but that's what they were saying back in your days too. So I'm still hoping that someone, some minds are smart enough to figure out some way to actually, you know, <laughs> deter crime and arrest the bad guys. It doesn't seem like well, it's too much to have. You know, the, I, you know, I, I've written something when, uh, in a British uh, policing journal. And the thing is, is that, you know, not only do you have to have the, has to be the right time, you have to have the right people and you have to have the right people lined up in a row. It's not that if John and I were there and we didn't have, we didn't come up with Comstat sitting in the chief of patrol's office, we'd still be punching numbers in or writing reports and, you know, but, you know, you had to have Animal, you had to have Brad, you had to have Pat Kellahudders to help you run the building. You had to have Timothy, you had to have Bratton. And without, if one of us is missing, I don't think that works, yeah. you know? So, you know, so the thing is, is like, you have to have the, the, the stack of people. That's and, was there, yeah. Yeah, and then you have to have the, the the idea to the idea, and then the moxie to pull it off. So that's a lot to ask, you know. I mean, were we like looked, super geniuses? And I, I don't think so. But we were right place, right time, right crew. You know, we, when you talked about Comstat being rough and Anamone rocking back and forth, uh, which is a great description, by the way, especially because I. I can picture him. I've never seen him do that because he's a sweetheart, but I can picture him doing it. Um, I want to point out that a lot of people did not think Tom Stat was as bad. Uh, and there, I'm probably a selection bias because I'm talking to those who thrived in this system. But people like Artie Storch, um, you know, said they loved it. Uh, they learned from it. Um, they, they even looked forward to it. And it's like, I don't, you know, he's like, if other people can't, it, he said there was no mystery. He said, yeah, you had to go with a, with a plan A and a plan B. So we did. For every person that you would say was a loser, there was a winner. Somebody who was more capable, more forward-looking or innovative, or whatever, was able to assume that position and get promoted and bring more good things to happen. So, yeah, it might have been a little rough and tumble, but you had people like Storch, Esposito, and stuff like that. These guys, they I'm just done. boom. Yeah. But, uh, but on the other side of it is like, you know, people who couldn't see how to play this and there was a way to play it, you know, uh, like somebody from the, from the one, two, three in Staten Island, out in God's country comes in, the prison commander and goes, well, you know, I only had three robberies last week. So what does Louis say? He says, tell me about them. Tell me about each one. And it's like, uh. Uh, he says, if you only have three robberies, it wasn't your kid, don't know every detail about it. <laughs> so, you know, it wasn't just, you know, okay, I brought crime down. It's like, 
Are you thinking? Are you doing things? And the other thing is, like, a lot of this led to excesses that, uh, you know, so you start to find something successful, and then people, would again, would squeeze the life out of it. Remember with somewhere in Brooklyn, I could have been a 7'3", seven, 7'1", seven, one, one of them. Like, there's a lot of crime being committed by kids on bikes. So they says, okay, we're going to enforce the bicycle laws. Kids driving on a sidewalk, you're over 12, you don't have a light, you don't have a horn, whatever, whatever bicycle shit you need. So, okay, and all of a sudden, robbers start to go down. And so it says, listen, we're enforcing this stuff, and now they're not ripping off bags and knocking people over. It's like, okay, you know. Good, good thinking, you know? So then, of course, the Seattle Central Park has to try that shit out, and who do they get but a Times reporter cycling through the park? It's like, yeah, you know, you don't need to do that here. You need to think about something else. You know, you need to customize a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it was the 7-7 precinct, by the way. Okay. Uh, and it was somewhere over there. Nostrum Avenue, a couple blocks north my, of Eastern Parkway. Yeah. My, uh, yeah. my apologies to the 7-7. That's uh, that's that's Animon talking about it, by the way. Yeah. Same same story. The chief wants bicycle summons. It's just, no, I I didn't. Oh, chief wants less robberies. <laughs> he doesn't care about bicycle summonses. If bicycle summonses achieves that goal, that's good for you. But it might but not when we get down to bicycle summonses as a priority, we can we can consider the war one and turn the key in the lock, and we all go home. Right. You know? So when was the first? So I want to go back to um, I was jokingly and perhaps too dismissive of the uh, tech savvy here involved because the, the concept was simple but but um what's your computer background john zero i um basically yeah, self- john come on, come on. self-taught uh, uh, accounts um, well, um, i had i i like tinkering and and initially when i was in the seven three i set up at the time uh, a bbs a bulletin board system i guess it would be you know kind of like these different social media sites and stuff that you have nowadays, I called it Fort Z, Fort Zindernuf, which was the nickname of the 73 precinct. And I, it, you didn't have real computers at the time. So I had to run it on a five and a quarter inch floppy. And then I sent off to China for a three and a half inch and a special ribbon to connect them and wrote a whole bunch of, at the time it was all DOS batch files to flip back and forth because one disk couldn't contain enough information to actually load the BBS and then it'll let you log on and do what you wanted to do. Uh, and then it, uh, it grew a little bit from there where I was able to add a 500 uh, meg hard drive or a five meg hard drive, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, five meg. And then I got an eight, uh, a 286 computer and eventually got all the way up to a 386 SX. Uh, so, uh, uh, but I, I, I just taught myself. And then when we were doing a thing up in Comstat, again, what do I know? I, man- I managed to get uh, a manual for Fox Pro and I read it. And when I had to do functions and things like, you know, time and between this date and that date, you go to the back of the book, there's the index, it says date, page 289, <laughs> go to page 289, da, 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 da. And then when I would get stuck, I used to go downstairs and plead with this fellow, Steve Egger, who was a first grade detective uh, in the chief of detectives office, uh, who was extremely talented in that and quite the crime fighter himself. Uh, And eventually we actually considered, we trophy begged him to come up to the chief of department's office eventually. Uh, And and Steve was a tremendous help with that because uh, he used to code professionally in, in, in Fox Pro and helped us out. But uh, other than that, there was no training. The maps, I knew there was mapping stuff, but what do I know? Uh, they handed me, we got map info because the department owned a couple of copies, okay? Here's the book. No, what happened was is that Jack and I, and this was 94, went to DC. There's a conference in DC, a crime mapping conference. And I think what happened is that there was, Somebody of authority in DC basically went to the FBI and says, Okay, let's take me to the room and show me where all the crime is. And there was no such beast. So now we have a, a national crime mapping thing. And Chicago had done some, and it was based on it was like it was an auto theft grant they had. So they just decided to map a whole bunch of crimes. And all and there was a whole bunch of other, you know, had their little things going. And Jack turns to me and says, We're gonna come back next year and we're gonna show them how it's done. <laughs> And that was 
Um, Rangers, Devils, the, se- the game where Stefan Richer won it in overtime. So it might have been the second game of that series in 94. So if you want to get down to the date, it was a Sunday. But you really drill it down if you need Not that anybody sent anybody to school to learn how to do this, though. Oh, no, no. it's a program. Yeah, here's the book. We've got that info for you. It comes <laughs> with a book. Yeah, here's the index. box, here's the book. Uh, okay. Good. <laughs> So and even, even just getting stuff, so this you got a little laptop hooked up to a projector at the time? Um, no, we used, we actually brought the big old CRT monitors down there and stuck them on desks and rolled a computer box down, stuck it on, and they had a look at it like that. Uh, then they had so a... What program are you actually displaying things on in the meetings? Well, before we had, before we didn't have maps at first, so we were just showing them a bunch of bar graphs and stuff like that. I think all the graphics, yeah. And then we went once we got the maps. The first day, I did a burglary map, and uh, we brought it in. And they walked in the door, and I still one of these seals walks in, looks up, sees all these blue dots up on the wall. Goes, oh my god, they got that too. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it just. It went from there to eventually where we got the whole dedicated room up there. And uh, the, there's now the Jack Maple Crime Control Center on the eighth floor uh, with, with multiple monitors, big projection, big pro- monitor screen, projection screens, all sorts of nifty stuff. But we, we started by just pushing the computer on a chair in, into the room and they had a look at it. And, and uh, when, Ma- when Maple or Adam, is Bratton at all these meetings or, or is, is, is most just- of them? Most of them. in the beginning, yes. When we were down on two, he was in. He was probably he was pretty much at all of them. And then when he started a uh, less and less, and uh, Jack and uh, and uh, Louis would take over. Um, and then Eddie Norris stepped come in. Yeah, that's that, that's well yeah. down the line. But yeah, but Jack, uh, but uh, Brent didn't talk a lot. He didn't question. He he just watched. You know, mostly watched Louis and uh, and uh, and Jack do their thing. And when they say, you know, pull up robberies and, and whatever, the, the 112, who's actually pressing the button then? John Yo. <laughs> but you better be doing it fast because then they, they right. start pushing right. his glasses right. at you. <laughs> I like when the knee started going, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, let's see. So, I, and then, you know, Billy and I knew because, you know, these guys had a lot of things to do besides just this stuff. So, we would sit there and we're dealing with this all day. So not that we would direct the meeting, but we knew where the issues were. And we used to sit down and have briefings with uh, the chief and Maple prior to the meetings. And then what would happen is I might have maybe bring up the robberies, but I knew there was a situation. So I'd already moved to the next part and zoom. So they'd be ready for them. And they'd look up and say, yeah, that's what we talked about last night. And then they go right after the guy. And, yeah, because we collect on Monday, and then Tuesday, you know, we co- uh, Tuesday we get start to get the books ready, or we print the books, and Louis would always come around the door and it's like, "Is it crime yet?" Yeah, and then we would sit yet? down Tuesday <laughs> afternoon with Louis and go, "All right, what do you got?" And it's like, "All right, who's?" And then who's coming this week? So you point out the highs and lows. You point out who's coming this week, what their story is, and it's like we're ready to go tomorrow. And then we, and used, I, to, you know, we used to try to not every week, but as often as possible. Give them like little Easter eggs, you know. Uh, yes, what, what can we add to the report this week, or what goodie can we give you that next week yeah. to keep you happy? Give me another yeah. way to look at this graph, you know. Let's yeah. let's find a way to, to, you know, to glean something out of here. Let's give me a graph. My personal opinion: everybody has their own little like markers where concept really went off the charts. But to me, the, the when it kicked into really high gear was when we did these what we called arrest pies. We had gotten the arrest numbers. We put them on a report. And we're looking, you know, and uh, I had worked, like I said, the 7-3 and the 7-5. And we're seeing that, you know, they're doing 25 arrests over the week and stuff. So I said, uh, let me see something here. So I got the arrest numbers from the 7-3 because I knew it. I'm talking to Billy. And I'm saying, nothing for nothing. But look at all these guys. For the last six, it was, this was September, okay? For the last- it, was all, it was August. August. We came out with the thing in September. Well, well actually, no. It was July. It was yeah. up to July, and in August we were playing with the numbers. Yeah. These people, they got no arrest for the whole year. This is the seven three precinct. People literally throwing themselves on the hood of the car, saying, "Take me to jail." It would take the amount of effort required to have no arrests 
unless you were inside in a body brace, was tremendous. So we said, okay, let's see. So we went and I got a dump off the mainframe in a whole city, everybody, didn't matter what command, if you were in any sort of enforcement command, right from the, the 7-3 precinct, right on up to uh, warrant units, detective units, investigative units, uh, everything. And we made these pie charts and it showed zero arrests, one arrest, two to three, whatever the breakdown was, you know, four to six, 10 plus. And then to the back, we attached a printout of the names of the all the assigned personnel in, the, with a, in, in decreasing order with how many arrests they've made so far. And they filled up a couple of boxes of stuff. Hey, Jack, look at what we got for you. <laughs> well, it started was it was an old store in the police department. Uh, it was 10% of the cops make 90% of the cows. So he says, let's test the hypothesis. And it turned out that 23% of the cops made 68% of the cows, something like that, thus proving the hypothesis. But also the 27% of the cops assigned to, to uh, enforcement commands in seven months of 1994 had zero arrest. 27% had no arrest. Now, some guys are, you know, some guys are lamed and maimed. Some guys are, you know, uh, you know house, house. in-house statistician guys. Some guys are right, house nice. Like, uh, so, okay, obviously they don't count. But even if you take in that troop factor, people that you don't want, don't want or not going to make arrests, that's a lot of arrests that you're not making. We call them there was one commander. <laughs> yeah, right. The conscientious objectives. So like, the 111. So something like, so, okay, the numbers were good. And, says, and then Jack's like, okay, so how come 50% um, um, or 60% of your cops don't have a collar so far this year? And he goes, that number can't be right. And it's like, here. <laughs> here, take all of that, Cap. It's like, uh. <laughs> To quote John Yo, <laughs> you probably have to take some of these guys out there by hand and say, you see that guy there, the one throwing a rock to the window? Go yeah. arrest him. <laughs> yeah, they did. They did. And then, you know. Mm -hmm. But that really turned things around. And the, the idea was you don't go out there to flake somebody or lock somebody up for throwing their gum wrapper on the sidewalk. Go find somebody who did something bad. There's plenty of them and lock them up. What got, the fuck are you what, doing all day? <laughs> what, what, what does flake mean? Uh, not a legitimate arrest, you know. Um, Plant evidence. Uh, yeah. I killed the killed the lily a little bit. Uh, yeah, you know, exactly. All the state the case. Race, the circumstance. Oh, so not uh, just a bullshit minor it, arrest, but actually, no, some being less than appearance. truthful in your explanation of the circumstance. No, yeah, no, flake flake is bad. Oh, yeah, it's okay. Bad thing. I didn't know that. This is why I ask. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Everything we everything again. No sharp pencils. Everything above board. People have rights. They're citizens. They're not our enemies. The 99% of these people are good people and they needed us to come between them and the animals who were eating them alive. And you have to do that with respect. And we knew that even back in the, before all this, when I was on patrol in the 7-3 or the 7-5, we used to tell the sergeant to stay back half the time with my partner, Jimmy and I, and we go on the job. And then you'd walk in there and there's a rookie, he's just about to get in fisty cuffs with somebody because the guy's trying to put his 300 pound TV in the back of the car and he's yelling at him for double parking. He's telling him, you know, we'll take care of this. You don't go into a man's house on, on a dispute or something and embarrass him in front of his family and expect him to peacefully submit to arrest. You treat, go in there and you treat him with dignity and respect. And 99% of those people will turn around and put their hands behind their back because they were treated fairly, not, I don't want to sound misogynistic, but like a man with respect. And they'd leave that way. And you didn't have to go in there swinging away and calling for your dear life. Sometimes you did. Some people were just crazy. But that if was you can eliminate 90% of the problem, problematic use of force arrest, you've done your job. And yeah. then but you treat people decently. And that, that included, you don't flay people. You don't make stuff up. You don't exaggerate. And and those zero collars, the one of those guys with no collars, we're not talking about robbery collars or gun collars. So we're not, we're not it's like, you know, shoplifting at yeah. the Grand Union. You know, that counts. They you call know? up and say security's holding one at uh, the AMP. You, right. you, you, they're handing them to you. Right. Literally. <laughs> right. And, right. and it's freezing outside and I get to go sit in the station house for a couple of hours with this guy. He's my best friend. He's not, he's not my enemy. Come on. You know, I do that every, I do that every day.
But, I'd you know. be curious to know what the numbers are now. Uh, well, now yeah. Arrest, I mean, arrests, are, you know, there's one third the number of arrests that there used to be. When you're not indemnified, the people you lock up don't get no bail. It's a very dangerous situation for your personal life to go out on that limb when you know the guy's going to be on the street before the end of your shift. And, you know, if they don't DP it, you know? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just uh, decline prosecute. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, you know, I'm so, glad I'm out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to jump ahead, though. I don't mean any, you can still go on with anything here. But I let, let, let's, what year was it when, um, when Al Gore play, plays a visit to, to, to Comstat? <laughs> And this go. is also leaving aside the story you're about this, to tell. This, He's holding this up a, a, a placard that says of, Al Gore. Of my demise. <laughs> One of the things you might have on the table to tell somebody where to sit. At yeah, well, certain quarters. people can sit on but, certain parts of that sign in certain directions if we're up to me. Um, so uh, I will, before, before you go on, I want to mention, and I think because people often dismiss the accomplishments of the of the crime drop in New York and um, and they say, well, crime went down everywhere, um, which is true, uh, but I would say it started in New York. But I don't think people realize how it, this wasn't rocket science. Um, it was saying we're going to care about crime. Uh, it's saying we're going to hold police accountable for what's going on. Um, it spread very quickly. There were there were away teams that would, you know, go voluntarily and for money um, to spread the news here. It was on the cover of magazines and people came in. It was, it, you can implement this philosophy almost instantaneously in another yeah, city. Everybody there from, from admirals to, to like representatives of the Queen of Sweden, you name it, they would, everybody came. But at the end of the day, it's just accountability. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, <laughs> The the some guy referred to it as what gets inspected gets respected. This is this is it. Uh, I'm calling you out on this. You got to do something about it. I'm going to ask you what you did about this. If you, you had know? a corporation and you had a board meeting, and you got a division that's losing a hundred million dollars every quarter, you might ask him some questions. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, and you, you won the Innovations in Government Award. Don't know what year, uh, but sometime around then, right? Yeah, around then, ninety six. Um, so 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 Al Gore is coming. Go take take it over if you would. How what? Al Gore is coming to Comstat. Oh, yeah, oh, um, so Al Al Gore is coming uh, to want to see this thing. Now, when the VP come does anything, everything's scripted. Nothing's left to chance. I'm on the phone with the Secret Service multiple times. Vice President's going to ask this. You're going to answer that. Yes. Okay. The vice president's going to sit here. They put these little signs, like I just showed you, in front of the seats. And we had some of those small monitors there uh, spaced around. So there was the sign for Al Gore. There was the sign for uh, Rudy Giuliani, et cetera, et cetera, through the thing. How it was Safer. mayor at the time. Yes. And, and how it Safer, Safer, who was, was the police the commissioner. The police yeah. commissioner at the time. Uh, and, and, and so on. So uh, Giuliani had gotten in a pissing match with the White House at the time because they were going to present this hammer award or whatever it was. And Rudy felt that it shouldn't go to the police department. It should go to him. So if he wasn't going to get it, nobody was going to get it. They got in a big discussion. Of course, they screwed. I'm not coming. Anyhow, to make a long story short, they compromised on the whole thing. And like nobody was in the game. <laughs> and Gore was just going to watch the meet. So now Rudy comes in prior to the meeting. He walks over and he sees there's the monitor. There's the sign that I just showed you for Al Gore, vice president. And then his sign. Uh-uh. Nah. He switches the two so that he's closer to the monitor than the vice president. Now the meeting's about to start. In comes the vice president of Secret Service. They walk over, they stop right in front of the sign that says Honorable Rudy Giuliani because they count the chairs. They know where the vice president is going to sit. They do not want him sitting on a bomb. So he goes looking and he finally goes like this to his, you know, to the secret, ah, whatever. And he says, so he sits down where they put his sign. So things were off to a flying start. 
as the meeting goes on, we're up there, we're pushing the buttons, doing our thing. Um, he asked something. Uh, I don't even remember what the question was. It was the one I was supposed to answer. Uh, and Safer got up and said something. To me, all, literally, all I heard, it was like the teacher on Peanuts. Wah, 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 wah. Okay, he's done. He sits down. Now I got 200 people turn around and look at me because it's all script. So I give my answer, Mr. Vice President. Bah, 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 bah. Thank you very much. I sit down. I go home. Now I was home with back surgery from my car crash back in the day. They had to take uh, do, do a laminectomy on me. So I'm out. They had driven me in for this meeting all lamed up. So I go back home. The next morning, the phone rings. And it's Chief Van Mon, Louis on the phone. He goes, hey, John, how you doing? Good, boss, what's up? He goes, well, I got good news and bad news. Uh-oh. What's the good news? He goes, it's a beautiful day outside. <laughs> ah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> what's the bad news? Well, you say for blue or gut, you know, you answered the question better than he did. You embarrassed the police commissioner. You've been banished from Manhattan. They posted angels with the fiery swords at all the bridge entrances. And I was not to come back in. All right. This sucks. Okay, boss. So I said, you know, I tell you what. Could it send me back to the 7-3? I like it there. Or the 7-5. These are my people. I can send me back there. Well, that was the first one. They, these, these guys were vicious. They denied me going back. I'm probably the only person in the history of the NYPD who was refused a transfer into the worst precinct of the city, into the 7-3 or 7-5. No, we're not letting him go there because he wants to go there. <laughs> so they, they sent me off to the borough in uh, Queen South. Luckily, there was a, when I first got there, there was an Adam Mon ally who was the, 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 the uh, borough commander. Uh, he says, don't worry, we'll take, we take care of our own. All right. You know, this is after I come off the sick. Uh, then they had called me in. I had Mike Daly and other people call me from the newspapers, wanting to do stories on how this whole thing went down. And they brought me in the back and basically Louis told me, these people are savages. Your brother is still on the job. It's a hostage. Be, and they don't take them hostage. Just zip the lip. Go away quiet, and that's it. Okay, fine. So this, I, I mean, this mouth. is mob shit you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, damn right it is. They're saying if you don't play our game, we're going to yeah. hurt your family. Yes. Yeah, they, they, they probably end up transferring to the, to the Bronx or something. No, no, these people had no heart, man. So they send me off to Queens. I'm sitting there. I got nothing to do. I got no desk. They sit me down in the basement in a room with no windows. I'm watching Jerry Springer all day. But <laughs> finally, the borough commander, who was a new one, the next one, and says, uh, what are you going to do? For Yo, what are you doing for me? I said, with all due respect, chief, what do you want me to do for you? I have no desk. I come in at 7 o'clock. I sit in this guy's chair. He comes in at 8. I move to the next chair. The other guy comes in at 9. I go down. I sit downstairs. I, what do you want me to do? Are you getting off the job soon? I hope so, boss. Okay, good. So I said, the hell with this. I threw my papers in. I was approved by the medical board there's a two-step process to get line of duty injury. First, you have to go to the medical board and they torment you and they examine you. And these three doctors come to a consensus on whether your injury is line of duty related or not. If you get through the medical board, you're gold. you got your three quarters line of duty, tax-free forever. Sometimes people get denied by the medical board. And this, there's a second board that made up of half city and half department people that reviews it. And sometimes people get denied by the medical board and the other, the, the, the city board will step in and override it and give you the three quarters anyhow. You know, oh, chief this or inspector that, now he's deaf because somebody, he didn't have his earmuffs on right at the range, you know, and, and they give him the thing. Me, I go down to sign out on my allotted day and the paperwork, and I have a copy in here, I won't hold you up because I have to dig it out, but I have the original copy. And it's stamped accident in red because the medical board approved me for the pension, the three quarters pension. The girl looks at me and she goes, Sarge, I've never seen anything like this before. I don't know what to tell you. On top of the red accident is a bunch of white out and then it's over stamped in blue, ordinary, which means I hurt myself on my own time. That's a half. Then you got to pay taxes. 
I said, what? Rudy had via safe the board step in as their last pound of flesh because they just had to keep taking it and override the medical board and deny my three quarters. And they wanted me to submit documentation that I did not injure myself elsewhere. I had the best lawyer in the city, Rosemary Carroll. And she told me, basically, I can't keep taking your money. The fix is in. You can't get a letter, a letter from every doctor in the country. So at that point, I just had it to hear. I said, Hell with it, I don't care. I signed out. I went and I hooked back up with Jack and, uh, and we took the show on the road doing consulting. But that is a huge difference uh, forever. So no good deed goes unpunished. I'm basically in a hole probably about $1.2 million already. And, uh, but I do it again. Well, you live to TP and gas. Well, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a sad story to, given all you've done, that you end up being eh, fucked yeah. by City Hall. and, and Deserve no better. But um, at least you, you seem, uh, I mean, you seem happy in life at least, which is... We uh, did the right thing. You can't put a price on We it changed does. world history. Yep. They're going to build statues to you, Jack said. How come I, I don't see those statues, though? Well, like Jack said, Johnny... One day they're going to build statues to us and the children will sing our praises and the pigeons will crap upon our head. <laughs> and it's the truth. Well, getting the crap before the, 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 the singing, but, you know. <laughs> Billy, what are your lessons from all of this? And you've been getting you know, a pension I mean, for I, a long time, though, now. Anyway, yeah, I mean, I'm not, 22, I'm not 22 years, you too. know, but... Um, um, you know, to, to me, I had aspirations. I was going to go work my way up and become the chief of patrol or the chief of department. And of course, it's an idiot. I was an idiot because, you know, you know, I like to shoot my mouth off and, you know, I'm a bit of a misfit. So it was never going to work. You know, I just I got to 20 and that's I did 20 years in two days and the two days were an accident. It wasn't my fault. You know, but it's like, you know, uh, I'm done. You know, it's like, you know, the, the you know. The more you have to conform, at least when you're on your own, a radio car as a cop with your partner, you know, you can be as offbeat as you want, you know, as long as you're answering your jobs and compliant with the law and all. But, you know, as you get more and more in there and more and more, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, a doctrinaire, it's just like, yeah, no more, no more fun, no more anything. It's all politics. And I'm, I'm a, I'd be a great political analyst. You know, you'd want me whispering in your ear, but you don't want me. You don't want me to be your candidate. If you're my candidate, you're going to do all right. But you don't want me to be your candidate. So it was, I would say time to go. Just um, last night, I was going over an interview that I didn't conduct. He's also passed away from Timony. That's uh, was, was at John Jay's library. Um, but he says becoming captain was an odd uh, event because suddenly um, you you can't be yourself anymore. And uh, you have to now you're you have to follow the orders from headquarters and, and city hall and he said it was a whole different political game you go from the and i had the money as a lieutenant i had special assignment money so i went from being the top of the bottom to being the bottom of the top and if i had it to do over again i'd saw my fucking hand off before i took that captain's test yeah you're saying <laughs> i was making top lieutenants pay you making top captains pay with the, yeah. the rank like who cared? we had the we had the, yeah. the, the, the stars at the time so yeah i was like you know what you know so it was and, I, and my time was up, and I had other interests, and that's that, you know. Um, you know, because I knew I knew I was going to need an out. That's why I went to journalism school because I'm going to need another job. This is not going <laughs> to last forever. Yeah, I, you know, I, 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 luckily, you know, Jack. I went right back with Jack, so it wasn't like I was destitute or anything. But you know, that 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 kind of business has its up and downs. John John Linda Linda, who we haven't mentioned during all this, but who also played a big role, um, more fluffy, but he would come up with these little booklets and things like that for crime, for, for uh, whatever they called him, build a little booklets, uh, our goals and stuff. But I hooked back up with these guys and uh, we went and we took the show on the road. You know, also in part of this, and you know, we don't talk enough about it with the constant revolution, also came uh, all of the, the re-engineering. And yeah, it's another way Bratton got everybody on board. You know, uh, you know, uh, Linda was supposed to be making a thousand dollars a day, and they made they separated like made ten, twelve groups. 
of, uh, of people like one of supervisory, you know, talk about super, this, uh, this. People that looked at training, people looked at discipline. And you sat and you talked about it. It was cops and chiefs and outsiders of the department. And it compiled some reports and made recommendations. And again, it wasn't even so much that the recommendations were good or fully acted upon. It's that people were thinking again. People were talking about Again, why do we do this? Can we do this another way? Is there a simpler way to do this? Is you know, so or perhaps it's all too simple, and we're not thinking you know uh, enough about it. So that idea, as as that developed too, that's all was all part of the burgeoning. And of course, I wrote that report, and I wrote the supervisory report. So it's like, um, you know, you just kept your agency just kept growing and growing and growing there. Yeah, but, uh, like, you know, Jack and Louie were, were on the crime end. John Linda was with the, these focus groups and these, uh, but it all was all different things. And like Billy said, it all it did was it kept people focused on the issues and looking for alternatives and looking, trying to expand their horizons and get out of that mindset, that cage that they had been in for the last 20 years. And the Prison Commander report cards that we did, you know, I mean, we took a look at all of the, the, the stuff in a in a precinct, you know, all of the, the important stats, you know, arrests, yeah, okay. you know, some, <laughs> but right, put that little picture there. Kel, I love little color pictures. Uh, but, you know, sick time, line of duty, sick time, because then it was still uh, uh, um, an indicator of morale. You know, guy gets banged up on a job. Yeah, I'm fine. I'll be here tomorrow. Guys, guy gets banged up and, he's, and the morale is bad in the breeze. He goes, fuck it. I'm taking a week. So uh, all of these little things. And again, we were all thinking about, what, and not only like what do the numbers say, but what else should go in the report? The, you know, report card. What gives you a fuller idea of what's going on here, both in the precinct and how the, the precinct oh, commanders oh, oh, deal with us? RMP accidents. Yeah. Uh, CCRB complaints, you name it. And we just keep sticking yeah. extra line or two in there every other week. And yeah, it's got pretty, got pretty uh, squeezed in there, you know. But yeah, you know, it's like, but you know, it was a time when, again, innovation, it was great. You were actually doing something, you know, not the day old, the same old every day. Go on, let's go get coffee and, you know, we'll answer our jobs on the radio and go home, you know, or hey, let's try this new sandwich shop. I hear good things. This is like, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we're actually, as I say, changing world history. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, oh, I got to uh, put up the license plate there, if you would, John. Oh. <laughs> uh, most people have been listening to this. I, I, John so, is getting a license plate, and it says New York State, the Empire State, and the license plate is CompStat. That was my, that was my plate. That's I why I can't get it. Damn it. Oh, no, well, uh, not anymore. Um, Somewhere you, around two, we got the one from the President's Award that gave us a the innovation government. It was a big, big glass cube, and everybody and their mother came with stuff. I got them all over my desk. This is from the Israel Israeli police. Uh, it's a little pyramid with a glass pyramid with a globe in it. Yeah, all sorts of all sorts of stuff. They came from everywhere. We can you, for the record, uh, give the origin story of the name and settle this uh, issue once and for all? Yeah, I don't. I, I, it wasn't. Uh, it, we were sitting there, like I said, I wrote the thing. Everything was DOS at the time, I, and it was a 8.3 naming convention. That was how you had to name files. So I had to call it something. We had it in smart. And it was basically a big old batch file uh, that smart way lets you compile into uh, an executable file, dot .com. Or a .exe file. At any rate, but it was .com I, back then. You're not crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah we, we could comp compile it. Uh, so there was a bunch of us sitting around in the office. Um, uh, some of my staff, myself, uh, and I'll mention him in particular, R Richard Mahir. He was another detective that was up there. Uh, we're bouncing around these names, and somebody's throwing out this name. I'm saying that. Kind of that. And Richie said, "How about?" You know, because we're saying we got comparative statistics. So, do we want you know stats? For, uh, for precinct yeah. weekly, you're trying to work all of yeah. this stuff into some sort of recognizable, you know, eight 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 character thing. Yeah. So Richie says, "How about CompStat? Computerized comparative statistics? Right. Then that's Ooh, what that works. <laughs> yeah, and, and, it was comparative statistics, and I think it says on the, the report." 
which yeah. is computerized comparative statistics. And then you we know? have also include on the front to satisfy all the people, this report is preliminary and subject to change and revision because otherwise they, they just wouldn't go with it if we didn't put that there. Because 1% yeah, because, of cases might get reclassified, right? Yeah, I mean, that's all, you know, you know, as long as you gave us the right numbers, yeah. You know, I mean, sure, there's always been reclassifications. You know, the detectives go out and it really wasn't what you thought it was. Okay, we reclassified. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Same thing you know? like had Gene White sit there calling the hospitals every morning to find out if any of the shooting victims dropped dead overnight, you know? Yeah, well, and that was also weird because, you know, the <laughs> homicide count is like, is it the day they the day they died, the day the Emmy declared because they got shot, you know, and when did it, when, and what is the authority that they're dead? So there was like something that's like, is it Tuesday or is it Wednesday or is it this week or is it last week? And all of a sudden, you know, guys thought, they were more, you know, it's like, I don't want any of that homicide this week. So yeah. what was you it? You got shot 10 years ago and <laughs> the brain moved, the, the bullet got lodged in your brain, it moved a quarter of a millimeter and you died. So well, how does how did you categorize that in the NYPD? To be honest, I can't even remember. I just remember it was I, an issue sure, of debates, you know? I'm pretty sure it got how to get classified under the uh, initial date of occurrence. Uh, because, That's the FBI way. Yeah, we, we had to go with UCR. Okay. Uh, you know, but most of the time, as long as it happened within the same calendar year, it didn't matter. Uh, it was when you moved outside that calendar year that they would have a problem. When did I've already asked you this, Billy? John, when did you know, John? When did you know this was working? Because no one expected this. It not started in the to magazine. see it working almost immediately, probably within the first few weeks. There was little things, but I'm telling to me that absolute click point was when we came out with those arrest uh, pies. Everything just sort of just went, just steep declines, because what we month was that? Do you remember? Yeah, that was all, that was August. So yeah. I remember getting calls about it when I was when my my kid was being born, my baby was being born. So that was August 19, 1994. And either it was in the newspaper, or I was getting calls about that the newspaper wanted to know about it. So yes. yes. One of the uh, many of the frustrating things I find about uh, most people's analysis of crime and the crime drop is, you know, they'll talk about lead being phased out in the 70s, and they like. No, I mean, you can give specific months in a specific year. This wasn't something in the air. It was, you were either the luckiest by, you know, fluke of coincidence or things actually mattered. Right. Well, these are the same people who will say anything just because they want to take, they don't want to give the police credit for anything. People and, work, there are uh, a lot of academics who work know, awfully hard starting uh, with the premise. I'm that, real sorry, but they're idiots okay I, I, honest to I'm God. sorry they're idiots my sister sent me a text a week or two ago and said oh my god look we found you on uh, uh netflix there was like yeah. a 10 second clip of us in a meeting yeah. uh i forget the name of the thing it, it, it what's I, what's the name of the thing i want to see it uh, uh, well basically what the what the show uh, was about, uh, well, I get the name of it. The show, it showed that, but they basically came to the conclusion that Comstat didn't have anything to do with this. The crime was going down anyhow across the board. Uh, crime had started going down and it was, it was just uh, uh, BS. Uh, Someone explain that acceleration to me. Someone to explain to me how that happened, you know. It so was, the crime's going down, and next thing is what the crime is at the bottom of a fucking ravine. Tell me how that acceleration happened. You know? And the idea that it was already uh, going on is uh, decreasing is factually true, but sort of misses the big point, yeah. which is the fall well, into the fucking down, ravine. And it, right, but it was a lot. It was still going on around 100,000 homicides, 100, not homicides, 100,000 robbers, 100,000 auto thefts. And all of a sudden, they were, you know, all of a sudden, it's like gone to next, really down the screen. So somebody explain this to me. There it you is. Know? Freakonomics. Oh. oh, yeah, Freakonomics. I was in that book. And Freakonomics, Stephen Dubner is the guy who, who was the writer of the thing. But, you know, of course, the whole thing about, you know, um, um, uh, abortions and all of that, you know, some it was an academic from England said, you know, well, you check the high school age, you know, your your main perp age and high school enrollment was a, was the same, you know, over over the course of time. It wasn't like all of a sudden there were no children. 
all of a sudden there were no perp age children. It was it was you know also in the that 90s, one has been discredited. Also and in quite, the 90s, and poverty by the way, went up. Yeah, and abortion was already legal in New York well before that. Anything but to give credit where the credit was due. Even New York, and it was Jack Maple who said, you know, how many shootings did we have last year? And that year it was probably four or five thousand or something. Um but he's like the 35,000 cops. I like those odds. It's not like they're 35,000 shooters and yeah. 2,000 cops. But the funny thing is, is, is when Jack said how many shootings were there last year, we didn't know. We didn't have recorded it nowhere. No um, one because you had it as, um, you know, if I shot at you and I hit you, it's either attempted murder or assault. And if I shot at you and missed, it's a reckless endangerment or whatever. You know, so, uh, you know, shooting incidents and shooting victims because first we say shooting victims, all right, we can do that. Then it's like, well, how many incidents? How many, you know, like m multiple shootings? And we wound up uh, defining what a shooting was, a shooting incident is in the, in the city, which is bullet fired in criminal manner, pierces human flesh. All right. One time a guy got robbed and he got shot, but he had a bulletproof vest on. Okay, we can count that one. But there was one exception that I know. But we, to our, much to our discredit, in 1994, we did not count how many shootings and how many shooting victims we had. And Jack Maple of all people just, just asked that silly question. And we didn't have an answer. No one We did. got one quick. When, when I was doing a consultant, I went to Atlanta. We were in Atlanta with John Lindner. I did an audit of Atlanta, their crime reporting. And when they were trying to get the Olympics, they had perfected shit canning crime to an art. Um, please they, define shit canning. Uh, <laughs> making things go away, throwing it into the garbage. They had file cabinet with a drawer. You'd open a drawer, there was a stack of rape reports. You say, what are these in here for? They're not counting. Well, no, if they don't call back, we don't count it. Oh, bullets fired through the window in a house. No, that's not, that's criminal mischief to the window. No, it's not. There was, it ended up, when we got done, they were going down with about 50% of their crime, making it just disappear. Uh, it's a tough game to play because you got to keep that up every year i mean it, it's it's a crazy no, no, i don't have to keep it up as long as i don't have to keep it up until i get promoted or retire i don't yes. have to keep it up forever and it's the next that guy, is the sure. next idiot's problem <laughs> hey billy how do you define an, an oak leaf i got a quote of you saying in that context i get my oak leaf and i cut it because i can't i know what it means but i don't know how to write it I get, well, I get, you get promoted for, so from well from captain you know it's the next rank up so it's you know so you have the insignia of i guess a major but uh, it's a um, DI. Um, it's DI. But it, what it is 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 it's the first, above captain. Everything is discretionary. So your captain, they got they got to promote you to captain unless you know you've committed a crime. If you pass the test, you're getting promoted. After that, it's all discretionary. It's all politics, which is a lot of the reason why I never became one. Or you know, so um, but that's you got to play the game. So that's you get that you get your oak leaf and you're out of there. And that's the game, you know, it's like, okay, I got promoted. Now I'm going to a different precinct. And, you know, this poor schnook now gets, gets the, whoever's replacing me, he gets handed this, this festering pile of shit and knock yourself out, dude. <laughs> How often do people get demoted at that level? They were just transferred. Almost to never. Back, okay. No, no, really. But back then, when we start, when, when we first started, it wasn't so much demotions. They would all be heading for the pension section. <laughs> Because they tended to be older, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, when you get your time, it's like you're going to go because you got nothing. There's nothing here for you. Some weren't going to go. So did we <laughs> remember, what, I want to, again, I don't know the names because, you know, these are all respectable people who had to work to get their rank somewhere along the line. Uh, but we had two of them up there, chiefs, who really didn't like each other. And we banished, they, Louis banished them to this to the same unit where they would literally fight over who got the morning paper. Okay. And they had, but they had nothing to do. The unit had no function. And, and, and they just left them there until they decided, okay, enough. I got to go. Remember? Yeah. Oh, that's it was a load of fun stuff, you know? Often uh, the other one. But I, you know, there was, uh, 
Another guy, you know, he like threw the chair, not at Louie, but got up and kicked his chair, of course, you know. And then uh, Simonetti with the, uh, you know, that, you know, okay, one of the, that's bullshit, Louie, you know. We, so uh, I guess, Louie, I saw that in, uh, not to give anything away on your forthcoming novel, but the, the Pinocchio incident. Sometimes things Pinocchio happen. incident, but that's been all written about. But please, um, yeah. but, but how about from your perspective? Everyone talks about it. And it was just, well, I, I feel a little guilty highlighting it because least, it was just. My you know, perspective was probably the least perspective you would want to have because it was the worst. OK, I'm a piddly sergeant. OK, and I come in with a scan of my kids video VCR box of Pinocchio. And they just thought it was the best thing. So they said, okay, when we give you the high sign, you put it up. Well, up comes Pinocchio and Simonetti. Disrespect. Oh, they went to Bratton. They yelled, they screamed. They all had to apologize and do whatever. Me, I had to do physical penance. <laughs> and they made me go out to Staten Island and tutor Simonetti's people and, uh, you know, over and over again, I'm so sorry, Chief. I'm so sorry, Chief. I didn't intend anything bad by a Chief. I'm so sorry. I made a couple of makeup. And then go out there and tutor his people on Comstat to pay off my debt. Hey, listen, you know, at least, at least all is forgiven. Because, you know, if Louis keeled over and died, that was the other thing. The tightrope you're on. So if Louis and Jack keel over and die, I mean, we're just out there. Yeah, well, eventually that's what happened to me. But yeah. <laughs> I survived. I survived on charm and and uh, yeah. and, uh, and report writing. And if I'm surviving on charm, there's, there's problems. But you know, it's uh, you know you're worried about you know Jesus if he goes. You know these guys, oh, the yeah. knives are coming out. They were yeah. We were you were dead man walking. We knew it. We knew it. Uh-huh. You know, just the way. But we did what we did. We did. What, so what? Big deal. What, what's the worst you're gonna do to me? Torment me? Send me through a toll? You know, we found out what the worst they could do to you was anyway. So yeah, right, exactly. So you know, it didn't matter. It ended up getting it anyhow. No, and as I've said before, I believe on the last podcast or in the book, it's hey, they'll need me before I need them. You can send me away and banish me. You're gonna need me. You're gonna need me to write something for you. Uh, yeah, Animon describes the Pinocchio incident. He said it is not one of my most endearing memories so at least all on top of the you know just the police department hierarchy here you have two old school italians yeah it's respect not good you know <laughs> thanks for listening everybody this is peter moscos this has been quality policing um with two quality guys john yo and william gorta the uh the geniuses behind uh comstat thanks for listening Thank you.